Bulavinaga. My name is David Gege. I'm the acting director of the Ocine Center for Arts, Culture and Pacific Studies here at the University of the South Pacific at Lothala campus. Uh, welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. And in this session, I'll be talking about indigenous Pacific epistemologies. At the end of the session, you will be able to develop a fundamental understanding of how Pacific cultures or societies construct knowledge. You'll be able to develop a deeper understanding of and respect for cultural and epistemological diversity in the Pacific. And third, you'll be able to critically evaluate the role Pacific epistemologies play in both Pacific societies as well as metrocentric societies. Now before we delve into the specific question of what is specific or Oceania indigenous epistemologies, let us first answer the general question of what is epistemology. Epistemology is a big word which at first sight might be scary or frightening as it might remind you of other big words such as ontology, which is the study of reality or what exists. Methodology, the study of research methods. Phenomenology, the study of phenomena or events that occur in life. Or theology, the study of deity or things divine, in other words, the study of God. Or sociology, the study of human social relationships and institutions, in other words, the study of society. Epistemology is a branch of philosophy which is concerned with how we, or human cultures, construct knowledge. It consists of two Greek words combined, epistem, which means knowledge, and logos, which means word, or science, or the study of. It is used interchangeably with the theory of knowledge, and you might not have heard of epistemology before, but you might have heard of the theory of knowledge. They are the two, they're the same, they use interchangeably. And knowledge, of course, is the noun form of the, of the verb know. So that in the simplest terms, epistemology, therefore, is concerned with the question of how we know. Metrocentrist epistemology is said to date back to the early Greeks, uh, for example, Plato and Aristotle. But this is a view that's looked at epistemology as a subject of scientific inquiry. But if we look at epistemology or define epistemology as the activity of how human cultures construct or create knowledge, then it goes all the way back, further back than the early Greeks. We might even say that it goes all the way back to the emergence of, of uh, human societies. Uh, these are some principal questions of epistemology. In other words, in studying epistemology, these are some of the questions that are usually asked. What is knowledge and where does it come from? What is knowledge made of? What does knowledge consist in? What can be known? Who can know? What do we mean when we claim to know something? And what does it mean to say we know something? How can we be certain of what we claim to know. What is truth and how do we find it? And I might just uh, explain here that when we talk about truth in epistemology, we are talking about a different kind of truth from what, say, um, uh, the Holy Scripture or Holy Writings talk about. This is a different kind of truth. Is knowledge the same as or different from opinion? If epistemology is concerned with how human cultures construct knowledge, then all human cultures have epistemology because all human cultures have knowledge. It follows therefore that all human cultures ask the same principal questions that were posed in the previous um, slides, but in different ways and in, in a different order. Now this point is very critical because it has long been held that Pacific societies and other so-called third world societies do not have epistemologies and because of that they therefore do not have knowledge. They describe as having only worldviews and because they only have worldviews 
they only have opinion and not knowledge. But the truth is that where there is knowledge, there is epistemology and vice versa. Then we come to the question of what is then knowledge? Epistemologists have yet to agree on an answer as to what knowledge actually is. And ordinarily, we might think of or define knowledge as a familiarity or awareness or understanding of someone or something. In other words, being familiar with, knowing and understanding. Uh, epistemologists are not very convinced by this definition. For example, they would ask, what makes awareness or understanding knowledge? What if awareness or understanding is based on some kind of defective or unreliable sources? For example, false testimony or false perception. By this, uh, I mean that, say, some you, you hear, you heard a story from someone and take that to be the truth. How do you know that the person is not lying to you? Or that you see something and interpret it to be true? Well, how do you know? Because your, your perception, your interpretation of the sight of what you saw might not, be ex might not be actually what it is. Traditionally then, it was believed that knowledge is what is called justified true belief, or JTB. Now, the justified true belief uh, position has been shown to not be totally reliable for a long, long time, going all the way back to the early Greeks. This was the belief that, uh, that knowledge is justified true belief. And then in 1963, um, a rather unknown philosopher from America wrote, the, uh, wrote a small paper debunking the whole philosophy or the whole position or the whole theory of justified true belief. He said that it's not really true because something can be justified, can be seen as true, and so believed, but does not constitute knowledge. And let me just give um, a couple examples to, to elaborate on this point. Uh, take for example, it used to be believed that the earth was flat, and so that if you sail enough away, you'll fall off the edge, because it's flat. And if you fall off the edge, that's it, you fall into the ocean or something, and you'll never come back. That was the belief ancient belief, until in, around in the 1500s and 1700s when sailors sailed around the world, explorers, and they came back home, um, let's say to England, to Germany, to the Netherlands, or to, U to the US, and then it was proved that the earth is, was round rather than this flat surface. That's one example. So the whole idea of justified true belief, according to Gittier, uh, has been uh, debunked. Another example that I might use here is, um, is the, the Earth and the Sun. It used to be believed that it was the Earth that stayed still, that was stationary, and it's the Sun that ob orbited around the Earth. Well, that was the belief and the knowledge then, until Galileo uh, invented the first human telescope uh, to explore the uh, the uh, solar system and he found out that things were the other way around and that it was the Sun that's stationary and it's the Earth that went around the Sun and that when the Earth, the side of the Sun was, or the side of the Earth was against the Sun they got daylight and the, the other side is um, uh, night time. This is how we have the, um, night and day so that when the Northern Hemisphere have or has um, a daylight we in the Southern Hemisphere have night time and vice versa. So these two examples showed that justified true belief is not really true. It can be de debunked or that it doesn't hold true in all circumstances. Now having examined all kinds of uh, cases since 1963, in other words, after Gittius' uh, article, uh, philosophers and epistemologists went on this whole thing, doing more research and trying to, uh, to, to see if what he was saying was true. And so the, a, a huge amount of publication came out, some of them taking the whole argument further than before, to the point where it, it just got to be too much to, to read and try to understand. And then in the end, um, philosophers pretty much, um, or epistemologists pretty much agreed that 
JTB, the JTB theory is probably our closest answer for the question of what is knowledge. And another reason why they sort of settle on the JTB position is that situations which question JTB seem fewer than those which support it. In other words, there, there was more support in real life uh, for JTB than those that um, uh, go against it, that challenge it. So that's how um, JTB sort of, in many respects, still holds its position today. All right, uh, that uh, brings us uh, to uh, Pacific Ocean Indigenous Epistemologies with a background about epistemology in general. Uh, we might say that a distinct defining characteristics of Pacific Island countries is cultural, ethnic, and linguistic diversity. We have so many cultures, ethnic groups, and languages in the Pacific that the diversity in this regard is, is humongous. There is not one, because of this diversity, we can pretty much say that there is not one but multiple ways in which groups in the Pacific theorize and construct knowledge. It only makes sense, given this, uh, this diversity. And it uh, gives rise to a situation that I call or label epistemological pluralism. I mean, there are different ways in which different, different ethnic groups in the Pacific uh, construct knowledge. And knowledge construction is not universal, but rather determined by culture or context. In other words, despite the fact that there are some knowledge, bodies of knowledge that are universal, the way a body of knowledge is created is determined by culture or context. Uh, we can say, for example, English, even though it's universal now, the way that English was created in the first place is situated in a certain context. It's a bit like a human baby, that a human baby is born in a particular context, a place, maybe the hospital or at home. Knowledge is, is exactly the same thing. Now, because of this epistemological pluralism, uh, we can pretty much argue that instead of speaking of Pacific epistemology in the plural, it's much safer or much correct for us to use Pacific epistemologies in the plural. So we can talk of Pacific epistemologies or Pacific theories of knowledge rather than theory of knowledge. There are two ways. I'd like to make two, two um, uh, distinctions here. When we talk about Pacific epistemologies or Pacific theories of knowledge, we're talking about Pacific, here in the Pacific, say, there's a conference and scholars come together in, at some island in the Pacific and talk about it. And so they can use Pacific epistemologies because, say, we can talk about um, Chinese epistemology in the Pacific or Fijian or Indian epistemology in the Pacific or Micronesian. But when we talk about, say, at some international conference where international epistemologists will talk about, we can use the word Pacific epistemology as a type of epistemology among all the world epistemologies. So, um, so, so I just want to make sure that um, we know the, dif the distinction between, between these two. All right, Pacific epistemologists fall under two main categories or two types. The first category is what I would like to refer to as Pacific or Oceania indigenous epistemologies. And there are two kinds in, in, under this one. The first is uh, what I call interior epistemology, or to use a language, a language I speak in the Solomon Islands, Tolo uh, epistemology. And it has to do with the ways that groups or communities living inland, especially on the larger islands in the Pacific, theorize and construct knowledge. And these groups have a large reservoir of knowledge about, for example, biodiversity. They ha they, these communities have a lot of knowledge about the interior of the islands. And so, for example, if, say, a student who wants to go do research for his or her master's thesis or PhD thesis, and you want to know something about the, the interior of the island, something about trees, what kind of trees is good for building canoes, or what kind of trees is good for building houses. The best bet of getting that knowledge is to go talk to communities inland. And then the second um, 
a category of uh, epistemology is what I call coastal epistemology. And then I use a word here, Hasi epistemology, um, from, another, from the same language in the Solomon Islands. And uh, this has to do with the uh, way that coastal communities, communities living along the coast, theorize and construct knowledge about marine life, for example, fishing, navigation, uh, telling when the next storm is coming and what kind of fish to, um, to catch at certain times of the year. Again, as in the case of the taller epistemology, say if you are a student wanting to do research for your thesis on some aspect of marine life, it would, be, would not be good to go in to, to inland communities because they won't give you the answer you're looking for, the information you're looking for. Your best bet is to go to coastal communities. And then the second category of Pacific epistemology is what I call Pacific or Oceania introduced epistemologies. Now these are epistemologies or ways of theorizing and constructing knowledge introduced from the time of contact, from the time of European contact, say beginning in 1700s uh, up to the present. For example, when the European first came, and for example, colonization and missionization, the Indian diaspora uh, who came to as endangered labor, laborers to work on the sugar industry in Fiji, Chinese and Japanese and so forth, these group brought in or introduced into the islands what I refer to here as introduced epistemologies. And uh, we can pretty much uh, see this um, virtually in any aspects of life in the Pacific. And colonization, missionization, for example, have played a, a major role in promoting introduced epistemology. Now, although uh, distinct, uh, Pacific indigenous and introduced epistemologies have an impact on each other. In other words, they feed into each other, uh, giving rise to a condition that I refer to as epistemic convergence, meaning that there are certain dimensions on which they converge, on which they work really well, and then there are certain dimensions which they do not converge, they, they divide. Now, why study Pacific epistemologies? Well, there are different reasons. And the first one I gave here is that it is the mechanism of encoding and decoding social reality or life as we create and experience it in the Pacific. And it is also the thing that the, the framework through which we talk about our identity. When people talk about Pacific identity, what is it? Or cultural heritage in the Pacific, what is that? It is through the eyes of Pacific epistemologies that we can give answers to those questions. And also for conflict resolution, epistemology plays a major role in that. Say, for example, when governments in the Pacific get together and talk about developing uh, Pacific-based conf conflict resolution strategies, what they're talking about is using Pacific epistemologies to give us direction as to what kind of conflict resolution strategies would fit or work better for solving problems in the Pacific. And the same um, happens with um, Pacific-based good governance. When we talk about Pacific-based good governance, we talk about, we're talking about governance that's, that's based or that's informed by Pacific epistemologies. And the same with Pacific-based uh, education, peace or nation building, community or national development, and that it's also the vehicle for which, by which we assess social change. When, say, we say something um, about a certain behavior that's introduced from overseas not being positive, that it runs counter to the ways we do things in the Pacific, we are talking about Pacific epistemology. It's only from the standpoint, on the basis of Pacific epistemology, that we can make those kinds of assessments. And then it is the fact that it is a fundamental aspect of Pacific scholarship. Importance of Pacific, Pacific pluralism or epistemological pluralism in the Pacific, why, why are they important? Well, one reason they're important is that 
in talking about them, uh, we are paying respect to the different cultures and ethnic groups that make up the Pacific. It is what I refer to as epistemic justice. When we talk about epistemic, epistemological pluralism, we are including every ethnic group, cultural group in the Pacific, so that everybody is, is given their right place in society. Everybody is taken into account. And also the fact that epistemological pluralism gives legitimacy to any claim we make about the importance of Pacific cultures and that they should be conserved. Now, if we are to standardize knowledge construction in the Pacific, the question becomes whose epistemologies should we use and who will make the decision, especially given this epistemological diversity that I, I was talking about earlier on. If we are to standardize whose epistemologies should we use, Now, if we decide on metrocentrist, or what used to be called Western epistemology, uh, we are creating uh, bigger challenges for our communities. We have bigger challenges now uh, in, in most things where Western or Western or metrocentrist epistemology is sort of held up as the criteria or as the standard or as the formula. Uh, take, for example, the, f the phenomenon of climate change. Uh, we know it is created by industrialized countries, but some of the resultant ch challenges faced by Pacific communities, for example, land disputes, tribal displacement and resultment, these kinds of problems or challenges are better approached through Pacific ways of knowing, doing and being. Take the case, for example, um, of um, an island that's uh, sinking, experiencing the sea um, water level rising, and uh, the communities ran to take refuge on the big, bigger islands and building new villages on the bigger islands on land that doesn't belong to them, that they not the owners of it. When disputes occur, even though the sea level rising has to do with climate change, when we deal with issues of land disputes in the Pacific, it is specific ways of knowing and doing and being that we reason, that we sort of try to come to some kind of conclusion where everybody is happy about. And another challenge with, uh, say, standardizing epistemology in the Pacific is that it gives rise to a condition or a situation where I refer, which I refer to as epistocracy, or the rule or government by the uh, metrocentric educated, or the few, as, who see as, as, their, as their right to rule the mass. Now, we've already seen this. It is already occurring, so this is not new. Uh, for example, uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, the case that only those who um, have university qualifications can um, apply and be accepted for good jobs. And the rest uh, usually don't get those jobs, or even if they compete in the job market, they usually don't get um, the chances or opportunities of being given a job. That's what I refer to as epistocracy. And of course, standardizing epistemology also gives rise to the existed that it gives rise to the existing gap between the urban educated and the rural uneducated, um, sort of lopsided. In other words, a gap between them uh, widening. So we teach uh, Pacific or ocean epistemologists as a vehicle through which to address uh, the same issues, the same conditions, the same challenges, the same subjects that are taught somewhere else, for example, climate change, globalization, sustainable development, cultural diversity, <coughs> nation building, political stability, or youths. We teach the same kind of uh, um, issues, subjects, but the difference is that we do so through the eyes and experiences of Pacific communities. So the objective of teaching epistemologists in Pacific Studies at the USP, therefore, is not only academic 
but, but practical as well, in which we engage the wisdom and expertise of all Pacific communities in making decisions on issues that affect our lives in the region. So that in the final, final analysis, our vision in teaching Pacific epistemologies in Pacific studies at the USP is democratic, principled, and humanitarian. <laughs>